Let's have fun. Father Paul Herrick is on the Heights podcast. Father Paul, where are you at right now? In my office. You're in your office. In my office in the great city of Pullman, Washington, which is in the Palouse, which is the Palouse is the wheat capital of most the world. I think the entire world. They grow all the food for the entire world. It's it's heaven on earth. It is. It is. It's rolly. W- You've been here. Yeah. WSU, yeah. Washington State University. Go right. Cougs. They Go just Cougs. won in football this last weekend. Texas Tech. God bless you guys. But we yeah. won. Yeah. I'm excited to have Father Paul Herrick on the podcast today from the Diocese of Spokane. Father Paul, do you want to just share with the listeners a little bit more about who you are and how you got to working on a college campus? I mean, sure, Brendan. Hey, uh, Father Paul Herrick here. I have been a priest going into my 11th year. Over 11 years ago, I was um, getting actually a haircut and and a shave. Uh, you know, I've never had one of those old fashioned shaves, and it was two weeks before I was ordained. And I get a call, and and I um, get a call from uh, my local bishop at the time, Bishop Supage, now Cardinal Supage, and. He calls and says, this is Bishop Supich. I said, I know, but okay. And uh, I said, I want to give you your assignment. I'm like, okay, where are we going? And he said, I'm going to assign you as pastor at St. Rose of Lima and Cheney, as well as the director of the Catholic Newman Center out at Eastern Washington University, about a half hour outside of uh, downtown Spokane. And I said, uh, thank you, Bishop. I'm really honored. Um, first assignment, first pastorate. And he said, you know, look, at you're getting old and uh, you're good at this kind of work from what I hear. Uh, so I'm sorry. This is your assignment. God bless. And can't uh, wait to see what God does to me. So I was there for six years. Uh, five years ago this year, I was then sent down to WSU in Pullman, um, a school of about 30,000 students. We were a Pac-12 school. Now we're a Pac-2 school. Um, and those mm-hmm. listeners know that now we play uh, the Mount West. And that's where we're winning because we're bigger and I want to say a little more dominant than the uh, other schools. And I love what awesome. I do. Yeah. Father Paul is one of the most gifted priests, particularly at college ministry. I think many people who know him could say that. The reason why I'm happy and excited about Father Paul being on is because I worked with Father Paul. He was my boss for two years when I was doing campus ministry work. Yeah, at Washington State. So Father Paul knows me pretty well. He knows all my quirks. I know all of his quirks, Um, but he's not afraid of that to, to show it with everyone. So Father Paul, you are awesome. Thanks for coming on. And we're honestly going to just talk about college ministry. A lot of what young adults are kind of struggling with today. But WSU, if you're in Washington, definitely swing by the Newman Center because the St. Thomas More Catholic Student Center, because you will see that it is thriving. It just went through. Father Paul led a big renovation there. The church is beautiful. And they do a lot of Greek outreach. St. Thomas More is located on Capitol Hill right next to Lambda Chi and Theta Chi across the street from SAE. They do a lot of work with fraternities and sororities. So maybe we can just talk about that. Father, what's going on right now at WCU? What's going on in the college life? Yeah, what do you see? What's just going on in general with young people? I I, I think, Brendan, first of all, I want to say, Brendan, um, when I first got down here, I only had one staff member. It was Brendan and I for one year straight. And um, he just finished his master's in, at, where'd you get your master's again? John Paul II Institute. Yeah, yeah, big, big smart guy. He's really smart. One of the smarter men I know, um, especially for his age, and I'm not just being a smart aleck, he really is. He, I was always intimidated to preach in front of you, Brendan, because I'd be like, ooh, no. And he every so often goes, well, you almost got it close father, but you may want to rework that thought. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay with that. I, 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 I need lots of help at, at times in, in some things. Um, so when I got down here, to be real honest, um, I was excited. My family has a big history down here at WSU. Um, the idea of working at a PAC 12 school, my time up at Eastern Washington was amazing. It was a, a, a 
I would say probably some of my fondest memories. It was just a total different experience, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. And boy, did I make mistakes um, on, on, on multiple levels. And, and I'm sure there's many people out there who might say, yeah, you actually, you did. Uh, but I think, I hope I've learned from that and the God moved there. And I, I just want to just say that I don't care if you're in a parish, if you're um, at a Newman center at a hospital, uh, I was a chaplain for a number of years at a hospital is that people desire to encounter the healing presence of Jesus Christ in their life. That faith, as they say, can move mountains. And I, and I would say that's sort of where my starting point is, is that it is a, a bold but simple proclamation that you are loved. And I was committed to make uh, this center, which is right on Greek Hill. We have a fraternity on the left of us, a right of us, in back of us, in front of us. We have about 2,500 to 3,000 students a week that walk through the doors. Um, by the way, Brendan went to school here too, didn't you? That's right. I was in Greek. I was a SIGEP. He was a SIGEP. Right. SIGEP. And so... We just began a process of, um, I'm a big, big fan of what you see is, is what you might encounter. And the building was in pretty rough shape. And uh, Brendan and I said, well, what do we want to remodel? We just began to tear things apart. And we remade the, the old 60s uh, coffee shop or parish hall and turned into a vibrant coffee shop. And that was going to be our point of entry. And how do we meet students where they're at? And we just got on campus, started talking to people. Brendan was yeah. notoriously great for what, what game did you always beat everyone in cornhole, the cornhole, the cornhole. Yeah. The we cornhole. did a cornhole tournament where we invited all the Greeks. We got like almost 200. Yeah. Maybe. 200. And 200. it was a full day barbecue yeah. winner takes home a, a Greek cornhole set. And who won and, that and tournament? Who, yeah. Who won? Do you know? Yeah. And I think his name is Brendan McCauley. <laughs> and see, Brendan, I can't believe it. <laughs> Brendan is about the most competitive human being I've ever met. And I'm not exaggerating because I'm not. Uh, and I'm like, Brendan, no, no, you don't get to keep it. And he's like, why not? I won. <laughs> why wouldn't I? Hey, you told me, Brendan, you need to participate in this cornhole tournament, right? Build relationships. To win, there's great solution. You know, <laughs> I, well, I lost with the spike ball. I let them win with spike. Yeah. Ball, thank right? you. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. And he yeah. let me know throughout the entire tournament that he was losing for the sake of the other. You're <laughs> such a sacrificial man, which I love yeah. about you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. But I, I would say that we just began and there wasn't a lot of anything going on. And um, what would you say we did the best, Brendan? What do you think the first six months, when you think about it, what were you most proud of that first year or six months? Yeah, a couple things. One, and I think this is just the gift that you have, Father, is – you just cut straight to the heart. You don't sugarcoat things. You're just real and raw. And so often when people go to church or they hear a priest, you know, give a homily or a sermon, at times it's like, is, is this real? Is this, you're real and you're raw. And I think that's what we did right away because we're both, we both have encountered Christ to where it's like, this is it. Everyone's loved. We got to tell them. And so I think, that was one thing that I was just proud of is like, we weren't afraid to just knock on sororities and fraternities and say, Hey, we want to invite you to this awesome event. Like we weren't afraid to do this. And then also, I mean, I think we laid a great foundation. I mean, we changed the mission and vision. We changed the logo. Like one of a big thing that we did is on the outside of the church, which like you said, thousands of Greek students walk past right away. We put up a big sign, scripture verses. Do you remember the scripture verses? Yeah. I mean, it's still I on do. there, right? Yeah. You haven't do taken you remember down. what they were? Yeah. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? That's what are you right. looking for? And then come and see Jesus's first words, you know, written in the gospel of John, the first words out of Jesus mouth to the apostles is what are you looking for? All of these Greek, you know, sororities, fraternities, they're partying, debauchery every weekend, weekend sleeping around. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And our invitation, and I know you're doing this and now it's growing like crazy, is like, come here, come into St. Thomas More and you will see. And ultimately, it will be 
the answers to the deepest desires of your heart. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the fundamental message that I think we led with, with our ministry is just like tapping into what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Come and see. And we'd help them come, you know, I think ultimately we always got them to a point that, well, it's faith. It is our, my faith in Christ. And for most of the students, you know, we went for everyone, but I just wanted to touch base with the Catholic population. So many Greeks, uh, there's a high population of Catholics in, in the fraternity and sorority system, as well as the dorms. Um, and of course, like if you ask any priests out there and, you know, Catholic school is a good thing, but it can be just something you do. You just go to Catholic schools. And so many of our students went, but there was no impact. Um, there was no encounter. And especially there was no real community. And so they're going to look for community. Most people join fraternities and sororities because they want to get to know people. I don't think they always understand what's the the other side, the consequence of what they're getting to know. Mm-hmm. Can you can you share like a testimony of whether it's a Greek student, it could be just not a Greek student, of someone who you've ministered to where you saw them looking for, you know, as the saying goes, love in all the wrong places or yeah. something, yeah. and what that process was like through God using you? I, I think I think for all ministers, especially priests, we're a spiritual father, and, and I don't back down on that. I, I think in particular there's a young man um, named Cody, and Cody was, came from a, a really great Catholic family. Um, got to know his family really well, Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, joins the fraternity. And he came to Mass one or two times, and then bit by bit I met him. He's just a you know, a handsome, young, clean cut guy, just my father, very, but bit by bit, I saw how this young man's, he just sort of began to fold into himself. And I thought, where did the joy go? And I, and I just finally started asking the question, Cody, how's your heart? It's fine, father. Walked by and I didn't see him as much. I would see him on campus. I'd say, Cody, it's good to see you. Hey, I need to ask you something. How's your heart doing? It's fine, father. It's fine. And then um, probably about, I would say the, the second semester of the, his first year as a freshman, he comes into the sacristy and after um, mass and I'm, you know, taking off my vestments and he looks at me, he goes, don't ask me about how my heart is father, because it's a wreck. I am a mess. And he fell to his knees and just started sobbing uncontrollably. He goes, father, I need help. I've entered a, a, a a level of my life that I never, I never thought I would engage in what I'm engaging in. Would you please help? And where do we always begin? I think it's the story of what the prodigal son, he had everything and he went to something else. And I said, you know, the father wants to run after you and he sees that pain, Cody. Well, you know, we took care of some business. He went to the reconciliation and began a process of transformation. Um, There's another, um, young man by the name of Lucas. And Lucas is a great young man. He's down in Belize right now serving with the salt missionaries. And he was in a fraternity and he was sort of all that. And it's just sort of a a character and and, um, very confident in his abilities and everything. And he got dropped from the fraternity. And he, I saw him in the chapel one afternoon and he's in there and he's pretty upset. And he goes, father, I just got dropped. And and I said, well, what happened? He told me and just the same scenario. He goes, I thought this is what was going to give me life. And I will say this. I, I could tell you story after story of the broken hearted boy or the broken hearted girl. You know, one of the biggest things I, I, I say, I think the role of any minister, I don't care, lay or ordained, especially in this ministry, is to help young men and young women go from boyhood to manhood, from from girls to women. And those are big transitional points. Uh, I would hate to be 18 again. 18 was hard. And I will say this, is that I can give you hundreds and hundreds of stories of young men who've had to really, and young women who's had to face themselves. But I can tell you with those two men, Cody now is the number one leader of Greek outreach and he is, he is killing it today. Lucas is down in Belize as a missionary serving for the next year, minimum, maybe two, 
teaching and thriving. He was end up being the MCs for and overseeing all of our altar servers. But he had to he had to make a decision, you know. And I think campus ministry is I think it's a hard ministry. Uh, I wouldn't say harder. I think it's the the challenge is you got to be with them. It's not some ethereal things. We need good theology. We need good sacrament. We need good programming. But boy, 90 percent of it really is. Um, we talk about accompaniment mm-hmm. and, and it's messy. And I, and I have no doubt you all can imagine the kinds of messiness. So it's been very powerful, but yet it's yeah. relentless because the world doesn't, the world well, isn't wanting this. Well, especially, I mean, you guys are right. I mean, college and like part partying is just, you know, it's big at WSU. And I mean, what do you, what are they, what are they looking for? Like, what are you seeing or just you you know, college students, young adults, what, what are they looking for? Are they just looking like for love and just like, they're just looking to belong. And like, how do you, how do they go on that? You know, like the healing process of like freedom, freedom with their sexuality, just freedom and confidence in who they are. You know, I I would say the word this past, this past uh, weekend's gospel and it's so powerful, of course, be open on that that statement that Jesus said to the mute man. But at the very bottom of it, the the people watching this said, um, and I think the quote is, and he did all things well. And I preached on that is what a great statement that would be on someone's tombstone. I just lost my mom and this past summer and we were thinking about what to put on her tombstone you know mother grandmother great grandmother woman of faith now we probably won't put this but i thought i hope i can say that at the end of my days um and father paul herrick did all things well Mm -hmm. and i think that's what young people want I think that's what the college culture is crying out for is to do things not even great, but just do well. And well is with conviction and truth that they know who they are. And I'm not talking about, you know, I always say to students, I just need you to be 18 or I need you to be 20 or 19 because that's where you're supposed to be. What draws them in? What, what's the pull? Um, People ask me that question. Well, father, what do you think the biggest issue is? I think the biggest issue is unauthentic, un- unauthentic relationships. Mm-hmm. I think people are craving to be in relationships that are authentic, they're real, they're genuine, but they're centered not just on emotion and attraction. Mm-hmm. One thing we're seeing at St. Thomas this year in particular, we've seen a growth spurt from, um, you know, 30 to 50 to 70 to to 100 plus and people are coming in and saying after four weeks of school, it's like, you're different because you are so real and you're so genuine. And I would say 25% of our attendees are non-Catholics. Right now we have almost 30 people signed up for RCIA. Eight Eight of them are, at this point, we're not starting until October, want to be baptized. I think there is a desire. Um, I think when we were talking before we started about, um, you know, what are the issues when we talk about pornography? Well, you know, if you ask any priest, what's the number one thing they're hearing day in and day out? Because I hear confessions every day. It's that. I think it's the wrong. I, I think it's important to confess that. But I think there's such a disconnect from our, and as you know, and you teach this, is our, what, what is human sexuality about and what we were created to be? And that seems to get all the playtime. You know, if you, if, if you were given this thing at age um, 12 and you're 20 years old, you, you think, <laughs> you think mm-hmm. there might be some issues around that or, or, or anxiety, or I don't like how I look when you can just always, always, judge yourself based upon what you see and hear. So I really do. I think identity, 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 and come from, you know, we focus on a lot on what's your desire. 
Well, I think it's the desire of all humans is, you know, to be known, to be loved and to be seen. So it, there's a lot to that. And that was a lot being said, but you know, it's, yeah. it's getting in community. Yeah. And what, so like going back to people, whether it's struggling with pornography or just dating, I mean, dating on a college campus, like, and even just back in high school, it's like everyone is talking about dating or, you know, is that something, you know, dating the, those you're ministering to, do you have kind of a message to them? Like, Hey, like, you know, focus on being a good brother first, you know, yeah, like what's the, is that something that you guys talk about, you know, or dating? I'm sure people ask you about it. And is, do you typically have like, a message for them, whether it's, Hey, focus on yeah. becoming the man or woman you want to be right now. And God will just place that in your life. Yeah. I would um, say, I asked the why, why do you want to date? Well, because I should like, well, you, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why people think they should date. Well, I want to be with someone. Is that, is that a reason why you want to date? I, I want to hang out with someone. I think, I don't think anyone ever asks. I think there are some people who genuinely want to meet someone and marry a person. I don't think that's for the college student. Um, yeah. I think it just happens. I mean, I, I don't overanalyze it. I, I will say this, and this is, um, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned when it comes to dating. I do yeah. believe in a, in a process of number one, that men and women have to relate to each other first as brothers and sisters as uh, and respecting each other. And I think from that standpoint, asking the Lord, well, what are you inviting me to? You know, what, what's my given vocation? Okay. Well, we have as Catholics, a, a lot of things, but well, a few things, priest, religious, um, you know, single, single life. There, there's a handful, of, but I think right now our first vocations from 18 to let's say 24 is identity is beloved son and, and beloved daughter. Yeah. I think when we really grab hold of that, we focus on what always needs to change. You need to do this as a Christian or you need to do that. Well, yeah, I always tell people, boy, if you can make a profound sign of the cross, that's pretty holy. Mm-hmm. If you really mean that sign, if you really mean that desire to walk with it, it's it it's not a oh it's not a perfect it's not a perfect yes when mary said yes i don't think uh, she she didn't have the blueprint of what it was going to look like she just kept saying yes and it's our daily yes that ultimately will drive us to change it's not always our big yeses or our big retreat experiences those are catalysts but they're certainly when I work with students and any success I've ever had with college students, number one is that if they said, Father, you taught me how to pray and you saw, you taught me how to value and understand the power of the Eucharist. I believe that the Eucharist is, is simply where we got to get young people at. We got to get them in front of the Lord and adoration. We got to get them go, trying to get to students to daily mass. I said, go to daily mass. I promise you, you have a new life. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of, I think, someone we both know named Andrew, who I think you he was he was a mass in college or broke down. Like I need a change. I I need something, Father. What do I do? Tell me. And you just said to him, "Go to go to daily mass and go to confession like every week or two weeks or something like that." And that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Yeah, Man. I mean, th- this kid, this kid came to me, bud, and he, and I t- I'll tell the story because actually I just was texting him yesterday, and he goes, "Well, have you talked to me about me this week?" I probably tell a story to someone once a week because it was so he was so desperate, and I I think in the Greek world most of these guys don't come in like ah they're pretty desperate. I mean, I deal with Greek. I'm the chaplain for the the men's football team, and and these people in these high profile. Uh, environments, Greek and athletes and things like that. When they fall, they don't tend to fall a little. It's pretty hard. Huh? And and Andrew was that guy, and and he felt hard. And he's and this is the statement that gosh, 
I can't say there's many out there, but his statement, I will do anything you tell me so I can stop feeling as bad as I am. Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? And I said, you know, bro, I'm going to give you a challenge. I've never done this. And I said, I want you for the next four months to go to mass every day. I, I want you to go to confession once a week. I want you to start coming to get involved with a Bible study. And I don't want you to talk or, or, or date to any girls. He goes, huh? And I was like, I promise you this. At the end of those four months, you're going to meet your wife. He goes, great. Well, uh, it's about three months, four months. And, and uh, I knew the gal that he would probably marry. <laughs> and um, he said, uh, Father, the dating fast is almost over. What do I do? I said, well, go, go talk to this girl. And they talked and came back. And 18 months later, they were engaged. But you know what? And this young man now is a, uh, a national director of, of in focus, one of the directors. And he, he is such a, he just had his fourth baby. He's 27 years old, you know, but he had to suffer a little. We don't fight for ourselves. Jesus is always fighting for us. He never gave up on the apostles. He never gave up on people. And I think we as minister give up too quickly on people. You know, can you imagine if, if Jesus gave up on me? I'm a, I'm a piece of work on 10 different levels. You've had to work for me. Like, oh my gosh, this guy's sort of nuts. But he hasn't, he hasn't give up. And I think people need to hear that we have a God that will pursue us you know, mm -hmm. pursue us deeply. Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah. And we, I mean, I don't know why it's just on my heart, but just being real, like, I think that's why you and your ministry on a college campus is so effective because it's like, you can be a mess. You can be a sinner. You're welcome here. You don't have to get all your crap together before I'm going to love you. Like, and you can open up your mess you're going to be loved here in this community. You know, I think like what you said, we're not being authentic. We have a mask on or we're trying, you know, to, to look nice where I'm not going to show this dirty part of my heart or this impure part of my heart because who knows what people are going to say. But I think what St. Thomas More is a place is where you it's authentic. It's real. It's raw. It's not people who are acting like they have everything Put together and i think that's why people can you know when they get to know you they trust you to where they just spill their heart open you know like yeah. what do i do father you know i i remember you told me about a, a greek student who like came to you and said like i'm sleeping around with like 10 girls like every month like 10 like and the guy was like i'm afraid father that if i get married one day i'm gonna be unfaithful to my wife and you were just like that's something you should be afraid of, you know, but for people who's not like that fraternity guy, he's not even coming to church, but he, there's just something in him, whether it's like the other fraternity guys at some point, we'll all get to a place where it's like, what is this life about? Like, what do I really want? What do I really seek? And you know, you're right there that they come to, to. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of, um, we have an organization, many of you know it out there listening to St. Paul's outreach SPO. And um, we started a Greek ministry this year and that two of the young men and we're going to do another side in the next month or so for women. And we just started going to Greek uh, to the fraternities. And we started last year with a Bible study of about six guys at your place. So, yes. And uh, and then I don't know if I told you this, but last week we had our third Greek night. 50 men showed up, 50 men and, and growing that they're starting to come back here. We've had an increase by 50% since um, August 19th in mass participation, mostly of Greek men and women. And I think sometimes we think we have to touch the whole campus. Campus ministers out there, who's your next door neighbor? Have you talked to them? Have you invited them? You know, I always say this is like, you know, if you're not willing to put uh, 10,000 uh, steps a day on campus and around campus, we're probably not doing it. If we're at our desks, we have to prepare things. 
we have to fundraise. I understand that, but it's boots to the ground. We talk about, you know, being in the trenches and, you know, I'll be honest. I always hated that. You ministers who are in the trenches. I'm like, I thought it was a little condescending when I'd hear a speaker say that. And you know what I would say to all speakers and to all presenters, you need to be in the trenches. And trenches is not just getting up and talking. It's like, if you're not talking to people day in and day out in the lives of people, now we all have different avenues to do that. But minister, Jesus, Jesus, what, what did Jesus do in the gospels? He was in the multitudes and he was in the crowds and he was in the 72. And then he would hang out with the 12. And then he would hang out with Peter, James, and John. And then he'd have a conversation with one. And who was the one? Mary. And I mean, he would just, he would just like, Go at it. And then what would he do? He would go away to a quiet place and what? Prayer. All great campus ministries, all great priests, all great lay people. Brendan McCauley, in your ministry, if you're not praying, I don't want to hear anything you say. That's right. Yeah. I don't want to hear anything you say because we can regurgitate a lot of things. Now we have chat, chat GPT. Is that right? Did yeah, I say that yeah. yeah, chat GPT. GPT? Yeah. I don't know. I love it. Yeah, I, think I think it's sort of cool. Write your homilies. I, oh, everything. Right. I, don't, I don't have to do anything. I can just sit here and drink coffee all day and ask chat GPT. But you know what? Chat PTT doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt for the brokenhearted. And I pray that the heart of the father hurts. I, I want to have that heart. There are days that I'm, I'm, I can be grumpy. You've worked with me and it's like, oh. I never forget. You said, you know, Father, sometimes it's not very joyful to be around here because you're so intense all the time. And like, I, you're, I said that. I, yeah, you did. One time. Maybe not in those exact words, but well, we've had our, we, hey, but that's okay. actually it's maturity that's, and growth for, the, for both that's of growth. us. Sometimes yeah. we've got to have hard conversations, right? Well, amen. And that's usually in every other hour for me. People are like, can we talk? <laughs> Brendan, why don't you tell them the story, though? And I, you, I know you've told it, but when you walked by St. Thomas and you looked in, I think actually of oh, all yeah. the stories I've heard, it's the best. Wow. That's a compliment. It is. Or Great story. A compliment, but it's just, yeah, no, I was, I think, yeah, freshman year, maybe it was a Friday night, Thursday night, was partying, was drunk, what, was walking back to my dorm. And on the way back to my dorm, I have to pass by the church, St. Thomas More. And so I was walking past and I looked inside the window at the tabernacle inside. And I stopped in my footsteps and I looked up at the stars and I heard the Lord speak to my heart. What are you doing? And I, maybe I was crying or tears, but in that moment, I just knew he was inviting me to something more. What are you doing? What are you looking for? You know, fundamentally. And in that moment, that graced moment was that night. It's just the, or the next day I was like, I need to change. I can't have one foot in partying on the weekends, you know, on the fraternity. And, and when one foot in at the church, I got to make a decision. Who's the man I want to be? How do I want to live my life? And that tri that ultimately led me to getting involved there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's a great story. And I, I would say that why we keep our lights on at night in the chapels, when they walk by the tabernacle, they can see that and that people will stop by. I'll, I'll watch them. I'll be in there at times praying and they stop and they look in and they stop. Yeah. And, um, I think it's time that we, we, we got to constantly go after those who no one's going after. I, I think, and a lot of them are just our, our normal Catholic kids. But I would also go so far to say is that we have just a whole nother population of students who are dealing with so many broken. We talk about broken sexuality and broken imagery, and and who people. And you talk about this a ton on your your podcast and your teachings, and now around the country and. Um, and healing, huh? We talk a, a ton. I would say probably 50% of my time is 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 done uh, working with uh, students around inner healing, you know, lie-based thinking. You know, I'm not enough. Well, um, or shame or fear. Um, 
I, I can't tell you, I, it's probably about 20 people a week that I'm dealing with. And, 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 and so I just think we as ministers, you know, we yeah. all have our different gifts and talents, but I know that's just, I think we had Jesus always was healing, constantly yeah. healing. I think it just is part of who we are. Yeah. And that's something that I remember you really helped form me in of just inner healing. It's like, what are the lies are you believing about yourself that's making you feel this way? I mean, do you have, and maybe you don't, you don't have to say the per, a person's name because they may not, may watch it, but do you have a, a short story of why inner healing is so important and how that has played out in someone's life that you've ministered with? Well, I think if you first watched, I'm getting more and more like, this is, let's just observe what Jesus is doing. Jesus was constantly, um, if we think about the man today and uh, this past week um, who was mute, it said they, he took him across, he took him to a, a quiet place. And you know what? I have to believe that that man was mocked and teased most of his life. And the beauty of Jesus is Jesus is tender. And I, I would say that he took him to a, uh, that quiet place so that for his own personal dignity. Um, I, I can say this. I, I um, boy, there's just so many. It's hard to it's hard to fathom. I mean, I, mean, I, I think on a base level, um, I will go over to um, the local tavern. And it's the college tavern, probably once or twice a month. And I'll be wearing my clerics on a Saturday night. And I walk through and I have a Coke and how are you? And, and um, this uh, young man stopped me and he was, he was a tad inebriated, <laughs> not, not over the top. Hey, Father Paul, it's like, hey, what's up? And uh, he goes, you have a minute? I'm like, when anyone who's been drinking says, do you have a minute? It's never a minute. So it's always an interesting dialogue that you have with these guys. Um, and he always says this. This is what the common things college students say. I want you to know, I love God. <laughs> That's great. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And, and I went to Catholic school. Great. 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 Where'd you go? I know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm a good person. Well, great, you're a good person. I, I'm just and and so I'm not. I'm just listening to him. I'm like, and I will. This young man is like, hey, I don't doubt any of that stuff. But can I ask you something? Why do you feel that you need to tell me all this when there's 300 people in the middle of this this bar? And he goes, I just don't believe it. And I think that's the issue. Jesus comes in power and authority and so many young people don't believe what I think they know. What's the greatest distance in any human being is between their mind and their heart. And I'm convinced that we have to get, you know, that the basic proclamation that Jesus can restore. He knows you. He knows that those, those, those weak parts of your heart. We're so ashamed of those parts of our heart. And I, so much pain is inflicted by others. Um, I can't even tell you the amount of people. I, I can't even tell you stories because it just runs over and over and over um, the trauma. And so uh, this past weekend, I'm around our fire outside, Brendan, you helped me build that fire. Well, you know, you weren't here when we built it, actually, no. it was after you left. And I was there late and I was there with a couple of students and this gal came up and she was just hammered. Just hammered. She's like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, what's up? I'm like, oh, this will be an interesting one. And she let me know a minimum of 15 times at how many times, what she named the church she went to. She told me about the pastor and stuff like this. And I'm like, she goes, I don't even know how to get back into this building. I'm like, well, what, what would be good for you? She goes, you know, just the fact that you're here and you know I'm really hammered. And you didn't say go away. I wonder how many people were really hammered when Jesus talked to them. I wonder how many people were in the throes of some of the darkest stuff and Jesus just went right up to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think we have to have programming. Don't get me wrong. I, I think focus and SPO and evangelical Catholic and all these different things, you know, Sikhs coming up. But with all those Eucharistic Congress, amazing stuff, 
but I believe at the end of the day, the heart of the minister is willing to walk with people to hell and get them out and bring them to the one who will give us life. And yeah. that's really hard work. Yeah. Most of the time, they slam the door in your face. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I'll never forget when you asked me, I don't know if you remember this, but this just kind of shows just where our times are at is you just asked me like, Brendan, is it, is it true that like these men and women, they're not just like, you know, fooling around, but they're actually having sex. Like, is this true that everyone's doing this? And I was like, yep, that's just the reality. In fact, and you were just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. You know, maybe, you know, 40 years ago, I don't know. Yeah. Some people were sleeping around, but no, no, it's, it's different you know, especially like what we, what we said about the phone and pornography and what people are being access to relationships and dating and the debauchery. I mean, I can't speak for 30, 40 years ago you know, when my parents were in college, but I can speak about what I'm seeing and <laughs> what you're seeing. And it's like, yeah, there is so much, it's me it's messy. It's well, traumatic. And, you know, in what you're saying to there, what was it like? I mean, I think it's just a different version, same day, different and more up. I just don't think there's this deep understanding. I will ask students, um, you actually meet someone online, go to their apartment, wherever, and have intercourse. Yes. Really? <laughs> Really, but yet you have a hard time having a conversation with someone terrified of that. Terrified yeah. of being real and just having fun. No one dates. I mean, I would rather have them be ready to get married, but yeah. just to go on a simple date yeah. um, is hard. Hey, you want to go have coffee so we can get to know each other? I mean, I'm really actually proud of more people I think are trying that because I think people are are so hungry for it. So I think I think there's avenues for people out there. But and if you ask anyone out there, I don't think anyone says, "Oh boy, I'm so proud of those actions." I don't think that. I mean, some yeah. of them are, but by and large, you're like they know that's too yeah. simple. Well, like you said, with the drunk guy at the bar, like I mean, I, I don't know his life, but but deep down he had to come up to you and tell you, Hey, I'm a good person, father. Like I'm Catholic in this, you know, I, I was at a party one time and everyone knew me back in college as the, the good Catholic guy. And there was like a sorority girl that came up to me and she had to tell me, Brendan, I, I have a Bible right next to my nightstand. And that she just told me that out of the blue. And I, I was like, okay. You know, I think like what you're saying, I mean, deep down, deep down, if we listen to our conscious, we know what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and, and hopefully we're as disciples, we're not, you know, what you're doing is wrong, but that we're there to where they can always, you know, come to us knowing that they'll be loved and embraced, um, you know, you know, when you were talking, where we I was thinking about, there's a statement I use. It says you're older a lot longer than you're younger, but your youth defines how you're going to grow older and grow older from college. I'm talking maybe 10 or 15 years. But when I was a pastor in parishes, they would always talk about when they were younger and the lies that they believed that then turned into behaviors that turned into a lifestyle that turned into a distorted way of thinking. Um, I think this isn't some nice ministry. I think it is one of the premier ministries in the church because I think um, I'm, I'm grateful for this of pastors. I said, gee, Father, thank you for the work that you guys. And let me say this. You're talking to me. You were a part of how many people? I mean, Brendan McCall, I'm going to tell you something about what he did. And it, it prefaces that. He said, Father, can I give a three or four part series on Theology of the Body 101? Great, let's do it. And we did it after mass on a Sunday. I thought, well, most people want to go home and have, you know, lunch and homework or take a nap. And I think if it's right, it started with like 30 and it just kept growing every single week. More and more people. And to this day, now most of them have graduated, said that was the turning point for um, my re 
thinking about how I was living my life, but especially how I thought, I think how I thought, because we think theology of the body is just about sex. Well, it's not. It's about being human. The gift of what being human is and, 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 and that our human sexuality is such an integral part of it. But yet it is the manifestation that God's given us to, to you know, we talk about procreation and, and the unitive and, and, and family and, and, and the joy of all of it. And I will say this, it was the turning point uh, when you first got here your first year. Um, and, and the students, I would ask them, what was the uh, caveat for them? And it was those four seminars you gave. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the, the Humanum project that you're doing is so essential. Um, mm-hmm. And he didn't ask me to say that um, yeah. <laughs> as much as it is. It's an essential part of, of um, yeah. who we are as, as people. Well, it go- I think it goes back to like, we're made for authentic relationship and intimacy, you know, like what you talked about, you know, you're, you're willing to text a girl and message them on a random app and have sex with them, but you're not getting to know them or having a conversation. And it's like, we're more afraid of that, you know? And I shared often in, when I do the talks of Dr. Dr. Cronin from Boston college, she did a big study with her college students where they had to ask someone out on a date because she was so tired of this hookup culture and how everyone's depressed. And they did it because you had to do it to pass the class, ask someone out face to face on a date. And these in, the people were interviewed afterwards. And one was like, yeah, it was harder to ask a girl out face to face than it is to have sex in a dark room where you can't see their face. Yeah. But yeah. then they said the satisfaction, the joy of having a real relationship going out yeah. to coffee was better than any hookup I ever had, one guy yeah. said. And it goes back to what I think you're doing and what you're so good at. at. It goes back to what theology of the body and what it means to be human is all about. It's like, we're made for authenticity. We're made for intimacy. We're made for real relationship, you know, and that's what actually satisfies us. And it satisfies us. Why? Because that's what we're made for, you know? So, you know, Brian, I want to tell a quick, can I tell a quick story real quick? And, you know, um, this past year, this past summer on the 15th of July, my mom died. And two days before she died, she was in writhing pain. She had cancer and it was a hard thing. But up to that point, she was doing okay just with the pain pills they were given in the head. Hospice came in and just had to take her and and, and give her the drugs that would give her peace. And, and, and uh, we knew she was, we were going to lose her. But as she was moving out, the, 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 the my brother, who is a priest, Father Bill Harris, came in and and gave her the sacrament of sick and they had communion with her friend who lived upstairs who just died. Um, and she, as she they, they put her on the, the, the stretcher and she looked at my brother and she's blowing everyone kisses and she goes, let's go, I'm ready. Let's, we all say, and students cry out, let's go. Well, that is a, a a saying that students say, my mom knew her desire to go and be with Jesus. And at the hour of her death, we were there and we did the commendation of the dying. She died 20 minutes later. She looked so strong. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. She, she was so confident in the hour of her death. And I just think we've got to, we have to remember that this world and that this this is that is fleeting. It, it goes so fast. I mean, boy, I remember when I was your age, and I remember being in college. But boy, as I'm getting older, I want to have that kind of resilience. Like my mom said, "Let's go. I'm ready." There was no fear in her, mm-hmm. and we live as a culture full of fear and all the all the stuff we perpetually talk about. Well, yes, there's times she experienced redemptive suffering. She suffered, but it was not for the end in mind for her. Was that her desire at the end? Was she was able to say she received the Lord in the, the Holy Eucharist, and then she said, "Let's go." I'm, and she goes, "I'm ready." Wow, I'm ready. I, th- I mean, I think that's you know I often tell people like, what's the last. Yeah. What would on your deathbed, what, what would you want to say? What would you want to be thinking? You know, would we want to be thinking like, gosh, I regret my life. What did I do? You know, all this, this, 
but kind of like what you said, I lived well, or I'm ready. Like, I hope I can have that response, you know, mm-hmm. at the end of my life. And- I sometimes think we always, as, as ministers in general, we're always talking about, uh, here's a great story, a young man who's just a very devout, young, 18. He said, you know, Father, I love all the talks that people hear about being fulfilled. I'm, I'm fulfilled. Jesus will fulfill you. He goes, the reason why I'm Catholic is not because Jesus is going to film, fulfill me. I'm Catholic because it was true. Yeah. And that truth is what has given me fulfillment. And he goes, yeah. I think we have it backwards. Yeah. The truth yeah. of Jesus Christ and the truth of our, our Catholic, it, it's, it's true. Mm-hmm. It, it's not false. It's tr- yeah. It, it's true. And that's what then gives life. And my mom struggled with that at times. She doesn't always, she was a typical grown up Catholic. She'd get your kids to mass. And, but it was not till the hour of her death. Isn't that beautiful? Now at the hour, it was the hour of her death. I'm convinced she had the most inca- powerful encounter with Jesus. Yeah. And I believe that's what's waiting for us. But it yeah. can be here on earth too. It can be here Amen. On, on this. A- Amen. 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 Yeah. Sorry, Father. I'm going to cut this out, but I'm at like 2%. That's why I'm kind of. Okay. Um, no my, problem. My, yeah. But thank you, Father Paul Herrick, for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for all the work that you do and for teaching me about how to be a good disciple. Everyone, check out St. Thomas More Catholic Student Center. If you're in the area in Pullman, Washington, swing by the center and meet Father Paul Herrick and. If you are a campus minister out there, if you know a campus minister, please share with them this podcast if you think it would be helpful and beneficial to them. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we hope to see you in the next episode. God bless. All right, guys. God bless. Bye-bye.